So what I'll do is I'll just kind of get going. Um, I am very, very new at this. Um, my biggest worry, though, at the beginning of the night was I've got a number of friends who wanted to see it on video and, you know, trying to get it posted up so I could do that. And, you know, I'm not really worried about speaking. The worst possible thing that could happen is I could just stand there, uh, 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 and then, like, something falls on me, and then, boom, <laughs> it's going. I'm going to be YouTube famous. I'm good. <laughs> so, yeah, you kind of a win-win. So I remember that. I remember to put the mic on because I can see the little thing going. My job's done. All right, thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right, Stephen, Dawn, thank you very much for letting me come out and play tonight. Um, I'm really excited. I'm just really excited. This is, you know, um, when it comes to like writing, uh, about as green as that stoplight over there. That's just how it is. And I'll kind of get into that little bit of story in a little bit. So, you know, thank you very much for, you know, giving me an opportunity. Um, my name is Rich Levesque. I'm from Westport, Mass. Um, Pride of you, Mass, where I met Tim. He's got some good roommate stories, so I bet you. Some great roommate stories. <laughs> um, I've kind of been there, done that with a lot of different things. I've, um, you know, been in, you know, special ed. I've been a 911 operator. I've been, you know, I've done this, done that. Um, none of which involved a whole lot of, you know, writing your story and putting it in a book. So here I am. Um, in the last year, I wrote a book. It's called Becoming a Vegan, and Basically, it's my thoughts, my process through journaling my way through a bunch of, you know, you know, we've all got our, you know, past ghosts, our past demons. Um, I'm no different. I'm no more special or no less. Um, I didn't really handle all of it very well. Um, these are pictures of me all right around my late 30s, just before I turned 40. Um, the one on the left, that one's the most embarrassing to me. Because I physically, you know, I was so down low, so depressed, I just you know, completely let myself go. This is me at, I had mentioned my niece, she's a type one diabetic, and they do a um, walk for her, for her, um, type one diabetes every year, and she and her mom put a team together. And usually, even at my worst shape, I mean, I'm, you know, I've never been a gym rat, but I've always been good enough to do a 5K walk. And this, she, this particular year when I did it, I was just so lost. I'm like huffing and puffing, and the real rock bottom was toward the end of it, I just went right down. Mm -hmm. um, scared the Jesus out of my nephew, who was like eight or nine at the time. And I'm like, it's, all, it, it's okay, Andrew. I just tripped. I'm okay. I didn't trip. I just and I just kind of let myself get to that point. I was at a, you know, in a spot in life where all I did was pretty much go to work, come home, stuff my face, smoke like a chimney, um, drink anything to like, to dull it enough so that I could watch the Red Sox game without my mind going in really dark places. And you know what? And I get up the next morning, be disappointed that that happened, and rinse, repeat. Um, the way my head kind of worked, 
there's this Buddhist term that it is, it's called the monkey mind. Um, everybody's got one. And it, you know, it's just like a loose monkey in the zoo and all the, you know, it's swinging around, messing things up, taking its poop and throwing it around and just making a big old mess. And that's what it was doing in my head. It was telling me that, you know, you can't go and take this job. You're not good enough. You're not going to have the money to travel. You're not, you're not enough. Of, you, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't, you can't, you can't. So it would talk me into not doing it. And then, obviously, the anxiety would kind of would drop. And then you'd be depressed about it because you didn't do the thing. And, you know, the whole, you know, being down and then being up is anxiety. What it basically is, from my experience, and I'm not going to question anybody else's. People might, you know, people have their own individual experiences with everything. But with mine, when I'm going off, I feel myself completely, you know, disconnecting from my body. My senses don't work the way they should. I'm not seeing things like obvious stop signs or, you know, any of those things, you know. Um, it's very, very tunnel vision like. And it's, you know, it is, it's exactly, it's fight or flight. The, you know, when, you know, it's necessary when you're running from an angry bear. With anxiety, you're inventing the angry bear in your head. And what happens is you just, and this is what happens with a lot of people, unfortunately, it's not that you don't want to live anymore. You're just tired of it. You don't know what else to do, and you just want to, you need to make it stop. And I've been to that point where I've really just wanted to make it stop. I've, you know, I, I planned out ways that I wanted to end it. I couldn't go through with it because, and the biggest reason was my niece and my nephew. I couldn't do that to them. Because I had an uncle that took his own life. And I'm still confused, I'm still lost about it. It happened over 10 years ago. And I wasn't as close to him as they are to me. So I needed to find another way. I needed to figure it out. I, or at the very least, I was going to go out fighting, go out trying. I owed that to them. I owed that to myself, even if I couldn't see that at the time. And I made a vow. If I can at least figure it out enough to get to functional, then I was going to do anything and everything I could to help as many people get there with me. I didn't know what that meant, but that was my, that was my vow. And I, you know, I went in, I, I went to the medication room, it held things off at the pass, but it doesn't solve everything. Again, like everything else, my experience, Everybody's going to have their own individual. That's the beauty of humanity. We all have our own DNA. We all have our own ways that things work. So what works for me isn't going to work for you or you or you. Or maybe part will. So, I mean, babe, but the best thing that happened was I lucked into an amazing therapist. And she was empathic, she was kind, but she also didn't put up with my crap when I stonewalled. And I, you know, I had 
gone in the past, and I used to be good at, you know, manipulating, you know. You can, therapists can be easy to manipulate if they're not onto you. She was onto me. Thank you. So, I did learn a number of, you know, tools along the way that really helped. Um, one was meditation. And, you know, people think, you know, meditation, they think end of the line Beatles with, you know, hanging out with the yogis and all the new age stuff. And it can be, which is cool, but it doesn't have to be. It can be your own, all it basically is, is you're taking a moment and working on, you know, just clearing your head. You could just call it quiet time prayer, you know, whatever, you know, you need to be. If you're, you know, if you're religious and you see yourself, you know, giving your worries to God, great. If you see yourself giving it up to the universe or, you know, whatever works for you. Um, myself, I just literally, I sit on my couch for an hour. I'll put in some of these, you know, like little binaural beats and, you know, I haven't found that they do any, like, sort of magic with me, but they give enough background so that, you know, the, you know, the noise kind of slows down in the head. And that's really all I'm looking for. Um, one of the things I learned was instead of trying to fight every time you were having an issue with, you know, your emotions just rolling with it, just kind of, you know what, sometimes you just got to take a Saturday afternoon or, you know, at some point, you know, maybe even take a mental health day at work and just, instead of fighting it off, just sit in it, just let the crap just kind of come over you in a wave, let it roll its way out, just let it, because if you just let it go and let it do its thing, that's what will happen, it'll just... And then um, one other thing I did learn later on was this really cool, um, we call it, it's called EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique, also known as tapping. Um, if you're interested in following up, look up the name Nick Ortner, uh, the tapping solution. What it is, is you're kind of you know, working out your own stuff, you're kind of basically actively questioning where your thoughts come from. And a lot of times it'll pop up, you know, it might be something from your inner child. And as you're doing that, there's these different pressure points that as you tap on them, they react. And it really works to like really, you know, pull stuff out. It's amazing. And obviously the thing that worked the best for me was writing. And it's really interesting because when I was a kid, I was always told I was a terrible writer. I had teachers tell me, it's, don't even bother taking this test or taking this class. Your writing's terrible. You sound like you talk, which apparently is a bad thing. Who, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and I got to the point where like, I would avoid classes. I would avoid assignments, I would put stuff off until the absolute last minute, and just, I would literally sit for hours in front of a computer screen. You've seen this up close in person, and I just could not get going. So it was really kind of mind-blowing when my therapist said, but after a particular day when I was just kind of giving her a hard time really expressing something, what I want you to do is go write it out and bring it to me next week. I'm like, what? I'm like, okay, I went through, I did it. It probably took me about 1,000, 1,200 words. I actually kind of found myself working through it. And I brought it in, and she was just like, this is amazing, but it was that like legitimate from here, oh my God, this is really good, not the whole, oh yeah, that, that, that's great. Yeah. 
So it kind of gave me like, you know what, maybe there's something here. And I just kind of kept doing it. You know, I was doing my, did my homework week after week. And finally I started putting some stuff up on my social media. I finally got, and I wasn't sure what was gonna happen. Were people gonna like unfriend me? Were people gonna like turn? Like what is, what's with this guy? And I'm like, really? But it ended up really, I kept getting a lot of feedback. Like, I relate to this. This is inspiring to me. And it, was, it felt really good. It felt like I was maybe starting to follow through on that vow a little bit. I was able to help people with what I had to say. Which is a lot of power, but it's also very humbling too. It's just really an honor. But as I got more confident, I started pondering a book. But I'm like, okay, how do I go about doing that? And, you know, I kind of, you know, asked around a little bit, um, took a call from a publisher after just inquiring on it. And they're like, yeah, that sounds great. And if you give me $3,500, we'll take care of everything for you. And I'm like, um, at the time I was like, um, barely making rent right now, so I'm gonna have to figure this one out on my own, but thanks. So, I'm gonna fast forward to September 2017. I went to a retreat up in um, Kripalu in uh, the Mass New York border, and it was put on by a um, transformational comic Named Kyle Cease. I don't know if the name rings a bell. If not, go to YouTube, type it in. Actually, you know what? Type in Dysfunctional Family Thanksgiving. Start from there. <laughs> and that's how I kind of got to know him. Um, <clears throat> would follow a lot of you know, self help, self transformation, some of this stuff. And where a lot of stuff would, you know, yeah, the stuff was solid and I got it. You know how it is, it can be as solid as anything, but if something doesn't have the right voice that connects to you, it's not happening. It's, you know, Kyle kind of had that voice. And if for some reason, I just kept watching stuff and watching events and watching and watching. And then I found out he was coming up to Massachusetts for a weekend. I'm like, I gotta do this. You know, it's what, three hour drive? Fine. So I go up there and, you know, the retreat was amazing. It, I, that's just my, you know, that's one of my favorite places in the world anyway is Western Mass. I, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And at one point during one of the breaks, I went to go and you know talk to somebody that I met and I realized I inadvertently put myself in line to talk to Kyle Cease. I'm like, all right, um, not really what I do. I usually kind of just come in, observe, be happy, leave, you know. But I'm like, yeah, I'll just roll with it. I'll just kind of do the whole, you know, a you know, long time listener, first time caller thing, nice to meet you, have a nice day. Except when I get up there, I, you know, he gives me a big hug. He's like, Rich, I'm glad you made it. He's really good at reading name tags. He's not. <laughs> and I proceeded to projectile vomit my life story on him. And the whole thing of, I want to write a book about, and I don't know where to go. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I don't know. How do I write a book? <laughs> and then he just looks at me and he just goes, I'm gonna challenge you this. I'm gonna give you the same challenge that my manager gave me when I wrote the book, I hope I screw this up. And you're just going to write a chapter a week, do it, have it finished every Sunday, a chapter until it's done. Just write something, it'll come, trust me because if you actually look at his book, basically the first three chapters are, what am I doing? I don't know how to write a book. <laughs> and then it kind of just starts to get rolling from there. 
so I did that and you know part of it was I kind of tied it in with a 90 day challenge where I was going to journal for at least 30 minutes a day and what I did was I just I you know, had a notebook and literally all I did was just write what was going on in my head was there something that I observed at work was there something I observed with you know, anything, whatever, and I just kept rolling. And then about, yeah, like the end of the first week into it, it kind of came together, like, I found my book. So I just kind of kept going, you know, at least 30 minutes a day, if I felt I had more, I kept going. And it took me right till about Christmas, and then it took me a while to work through that because if you just publish 90 days worth of scribble, even I know that it's going to get old. But you um, clear out, you know, if you clear out the stuff that's, you know, some of it's redundant, some of it's a little too personal, some of it is. just boring but if you tie some things together you can come up with I think this is what 198 pages and it's a lot of it it's just basically me kind of you know trying to work out you know a lot of my own stuff um, tying it together with you know what was going on at the time um, talking about some of the things that you know, worked for me. I don't ever intend on ever being a, oh, this is how you do this and you're gonna be free. No, it's like, hey, this worked for me. This was pretty cool. This is how I did it. And then from there, it's kind of like, you know, going to the Chinese buffet. You know what, if you want the General Tso's chicken, Cool, if you want to leave the crab rangoons behind, perfect. And that's basically you know, what it is. And it's also kind of intended to start a conversation, even if you're hypothetically having one with me. Just kind of, you know, maybe asking yourself what's going on in your head and what's in you know, your soul. Does this resonate? Are you, if is it really you know, triggering you? And if so, why? What is it that it's bringing up? And just kind of, you know, and if it does, you know, sit with that. You know, does it go back to something that, you know, that you need to work through? Is a guess. Um, the time, oh, halfway, I think. So I'll kind of go through maybe a couple of the sections and a little bit of what I talk about. I'm not going to go into a whole outline of I talk about this and this and this and this because, you know, if you want to know about this and this and this, you'll read the book. Two, it's kind of boring. It's kind of like sitting in, you know, junior year chemistry and it's <laughs> the teachers talking like this. So, um, one of the things I do go into is, you know, the childhood stuff. Everybody's got it. Nobody comes out alive. Or, at the very least, you know, not beat up or and I'm you know I do talk about you know some particulars in the book but I don't want to come off as like oh my god my parents were beat to me my and you know my kids were picking on me and all that like one yeah everybody's had that experience 
And two, I don't want it in any way coming off like I'm some sort of victim because I'm not. Um, I did struggle with high expectations. Um, I did struggle with a lot of sheltering and it did affect me, but going back, you know, I mean, with all due respect to like Dr. Spock and certain people that did do a lot of groundbreaking work in child rearing and things like that, there's no manual on raising children. You're basically, you're winging it. And all you've got to work with is how you grew up and how what you're kind of seeing around you what expectations are of your peers or what you see on TV or and it's I can't imagine that being a whole lot of fun And, you know, you're doing the best you can with what you have to work with in the moment and the knowledge you have. And obviously, it works out better for some people than others, but if adults have their own stuff that they haven't worked through, and many don't even realize they have things that, you know, it's not their fault, it's not like, you know, if you're going through life and this is what you know, why are you gonna know it's not okay? It doesn't happen that way. So that's how things get passed on from generation to generation and that's, and all you can do is at once you learn, you know, Basically, you got to forgive what you were dealt with and, you know, forgiveness, let me talk about that for a second. People do talk about forgiveness like, oh, it never happened, everything's perfect, we're all peas and carrots again. No, oh, that's not how it has to work. Forgiveness is letting things go for yourself for the purpose of moving on and growing in your life. You can forgive somebody and then, but still know that you need to keep them entirely out of your life. They coexist. So that's kind of an important thing to work through and then just kind of working through that with you know, everything else, you know, your peers. If you're in a tough peer group and, you know, say you got picked on or you ended up running with the wrong crowd and getting into trouble, again, they, you know, going through school, going through the system, it's, there's a pecking order. It, if I knew how to change it, I, I don't know how that works. I know they, you know, there's points where they do try and as, you know, you've got your classes and your ability levels, quote unquote, um, and you've got your separation and you've got your caste system, unfortunately, and I don't, a lot of us end up on the wrong end of it. But again, you know, you're playing the role that you've gotten, you don't, you know, it is what it is. Obviously, if you were picked on by somebody, you know what, and you're an adult, and you don't want them in your life, cool, but, you know, learning to you know, let it go and accept what was, accepting that they're doing the, again, they were doing what they thought was what they were supposed to do. <coughs> and 
And once you kind of let that go, then the responsibility for growth lies with yourself. Once you learn that, it's now your responsibility to go on. You don't have the option of blaming everybody for your own. But as hard as it is, it's worthwhile because when you, when you know you have the responsibility, now you know you can go get it done. Another um, topic I go into a little bit is toxic masculinity. Um, it's been kind of a conversation lately. Um, a lot of us learn to bury it. We learn to not handle, you know, we feel fear. Fear is aversion to pain. Even if we don't openly say it that way, it comes out in other ways. Anger, violence, addiction, self-harm. You know, we don't learn how to handle our shame. We don't learn how to handle rejection appropriately. That's a big one. We don't learn that rejection ultimately is has nothing to do with who you are in the moment. It's what somebody else perceives you to be. And it's all their own, it's all within them. It really has nothing to do with you, even though it might, it certainly feels like it in the moment. And with that in mind, what we should be learning is how to not take it personally, to not be seen as less of, you know, not having things build up to where if you get rejected, it's a hard drop. stays in and it stays in and it stays in. It builds up like a teapot and heat. You know, water turns into steam, it expands, and it's gotta come out somewhere. Always comes out somewhere. And I think when we learn to allow for us men to accept that, to be able to communicate what our own pain is and finding that it's okay to let things out. It's okay to have emotions. It's okay to feel things other than being mad. To be able to admit that you know, this is, you know, big and scary, and just talking about it suddenly makes it just a little, little smaller and a little not so scary. And just kind of one more aside on masculinity, there's a little side thing that really grinds my gears, and it's the nice guy. You know what I mean? The ones that try to slide their way in. They think they're better because they don't get angry and they're not, you know, aggressive or whatnot. But the thing is, they still have the same exact issues of being unable to handle the rejection. So when they think they're going in the back way, 
instead of it working out like you're Ryan Gosling making your, you know, farmhouse and Rachel McAdams is going to show up and everything's going to be beautiful and wonderful and you're going to live happily ever after. No, what's going to happen is she's going to think you're a liar because you were up, not upfront with your intentions. And then you're going to be like, but I'm a nice guy. No, 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 you're a liar and you're a chicken. And I say that as a recovering nice guy. <laughs> Basically, you have, you know, just because you go about it a different way doesn't mean you don't have the same stuff you got to work out. I had to get that in there. Um, and what other, this is kind of an aside. I, when I first published the book this past spring, I wasn't, once I kind of had it in hand, I'm just like, oh, I'm not crazy about it. Um, and one of the things I was struggling with, and I initially left out, and I put in this version, was a chapter of my issues with food. That was probably my biggest addiction. It started from being a kid that was my... I mentioned before, there's always got to be a way to dull the pain to keep going. Mine was stuff in my face. And it was basically anything with, you know, basically anything with flour. So, you know, parents came home with two large pizzas. I probably ate like one and a half. Uh, Mom made a big tray of mac and cheese. Oh, this is gonna last. This will be like dinner for tonight, and then dinner for tomorrow night, and then I'd get up at two in the morning, and I would probably eat about three quarters of it, thinking that if I left like that last corner, nobody would notice. So no, I didn't really. I mean, you know, they just thought I was just. But it was weird. Like I would get up, and it's like I couldn't stop myself. But who thinks of that stuff is? being anything that's an issue back then. It, it started being an issue once you, I got older. The metabolism doesn't work so good. And you, you know, you're in your 30s and you keep growing, but it's not this way, it's this way. And next thing you know, you just, yeah. <laughs> so, I also started to have um, other issues relating to it. I started having you know, digestive stuff going on, and I got to the point where I needed to, I'm not gonna say entirely cut it out, because you know what, Thanksgiving, I'm gonna enjoy myself. I might be a mess for three days afterwards, but I, you're not going to go to somebody's thing, oh, you made all these things. I'll just have the carrots, please. That's just not going to be a thing. So I save it for very special occasions, but I can't have, I will not have any pasta, any brownies, any pizza, anything, bread I cannot have in my house. Um, and for the most part, I cut it out. And I'm going to tell you, the first two weeks I did it, it was worse than I quit when I quit smoking. It was, it was miserable. Like your head just wanted to explode. You felt awful. It like literally felt like I was having DTs. And I'm like, I didn't realize it was that addictive. And I also found, obviously, I ended up losing a lot of weight, and that was you now the bulk of it. I probably down about, probably down about 70 pounds now. And what I didn't realize was how much of an effect that had on my mood and my well-being. <laughs> I had no idea, and you know, you go and you look it up, you start learning that 
wow, your gut kind of does have an effect. You know, it's kind of like another brain in there. Um, and it's really fascinating as I start to learn about this stuff. And it was one of those things that as I was kind of experiencing it, I went and followed up on. So, we kind of start to wind us down a little bit. I'm not going to say, oh, I am magically better, like, better than I was, say, two and a half years ago when this all started. Absolutely. It's like night and day. I wouldn't be up here talking to you about anything. Even then, like, I couldn't rattle off stuff about the 2004 Red Sox, and that's like my jam. I couldn't even do that. But speaking of stuff that I did, I really started to stop talking myself out of doing stuff. I would go on the trip. I would try to think. And it's great. I Before this year, I never left the East Coast. The furthest I went was Atlanta. <coughs> in June, I spent a week in Los Angeles. Had the time of my life. I thought that I hated the water. I surfed in the Pacific Ocean. Like, I literally, and the thing is, I actually, it wasn't, I literally was actually able to get up on the board, and there was one point where I didn't fall. Who was I? <laughs> and, but that was, and then in October, I spent, I went out to Phoenix for four days. And again, you know, along this way, along this journey, I've gotten to meet and you know, connect with so many amazing human beings from all over the world that would identify with stuff to you know, varying degrees. Um, and so many of them have inspired me to keep going, inspired me to just keep putting content out and to keep writing and to keep trying and to keep just doing stuff and not worrying about if it, you know, the results just go in. And if it works out, awesome. If it doesn't work out, that's also awesome because you learn things and then you get to go and do it again. And knowing that that's okay and knowing that it doesn't make you a failure if you screw something up. It doesn't make you anything. It just means you learned something. That is like, do you know how freeing that is? To know that there's, there's always, until the time comes, you know, we all basically, our journeys are this. We all have the same start point. We all have the same end point. We're born, we die. We can talk about what happens afterwards, um, but as far as being on this earth plane, we have this, everything else, all the good, all the bad, all the indifferent. All it is is stops on the journey. It's just, you know, it's Pawtucket, it's Central Falls, it's Worcester, it's Boston. Okay, maybe you go out to like Topeka and that's really what everything is. There's always a next stop. There's always something else. There's always another day. There's no doing something so bad that it's all over. I mean, yeah, you could talk about you know, doing something so criminally that you end up in prison. Okay, yeah, you're stuck there. But you know what? You still get up every day and even in that element you have an opportunity to do something
you have the hand that you're dealt, a lot of it you may not have control over. Okay, that stuff you can't, you know, it's not personal, it's what is. But there's that little segment that you do. Hang on to that like there's no tomorrow and just own it. Um, you know, kind of where I'm going. Um, in the process of working on a couple of projects, um, one is actually a course that I'm working on about you know, handling things a little bit differently in the workplace and, you know, you know, dealing specifically with how do you handle yourself better, how do you handle life better so you don't burn out? How can you handle the situations you can't control at work or the situations that you can't deal with? And, you know, there's some hey, how to do that, but it's a lot of working on trying to reframe what's going on, how to let go of what you, again, letting go of what you can't control, learning that, learning how not to let things be so overwhelming, because that happens to us a lot too. We get so, you know, a particular situation or a particular idea could be so you can't wrap your hands around it. It feels like this giant boulder and you're, you're right up close to, you know, if you're right up close to a boulder, all you can see is like these little gray and white specks. But if you learn to kind of step away, you know, there might be a little bit of a path on the right side. Behind you, there might be a um, bunch of dynamite. Make it blow it up. Make it smaller. And then instead of dealing with the whole big thing, take the small part that you can handle today. Deal with that. And then maybe another small part tomorrow. And just kind of work the steps. And that's kind of what I've been working with some people, you know, one to one with trying to you know, work through some of those blocks and those ideas and trying to simplify things into what you can handle today. Okay, maybe you want to change careers and you don't have time to or money to go to school and you can't take the time off of work. But okay, maybe you can, you know, start you know, you know, making connections in the field or talking to people or learning more about the profession. Um, you know, joining, uh, you know, a trade guild or the like. Or maybe start taking a class. Or even, you know, go online. If, if you look around, there's a lot of free things you have access to where you can keep learning more and more and you can just, and then maybe eventually that opening comes where you can get into school or you can get into a program to learn a new career. You know, but you do it one step at a time. And that's what everything is. Even if it's the smallest little step, like multitasking doesn't exist. And I say that as uh, somebody that was a 911 operator for 16 years and they and still, you are a multitasker. No, you're not. If you, know, you answer a question with somebody on the phone, you stop. You dispatch a police officer, stop. Maybe you send the fire department. And then it's like little tiny steps. And all of a sudden, that big scary house fire, that if you see it as a big house fire, like even now, with the time I have under my belt, I'm like, ah, no. <laughs> But you take every, you, everything is a bunch of tiny steps, one at a time. And even if you think you're doing something like that, it's you know, like when you're playing the drums. Yeah, you might, your foot might be doing, you know, keeping a beat, 
but you're not focusing on that. You're focusing on you know, a little razzle dazzle with the uh, symbols. This is rope. You're keeping, you know, it just goes. You're not thinking about it. So everything you can kind of take and simplify it. I'm kind of, yeah, you know, that's part of you know that project. I'm also I've done some videos on YouTube with people that are really just kind of struggling with life in mind. Um, basically, I, you know, I'll call it how not to feel like a piece of, and, you know, sometimes I'll deal with, I'll, I'll throw out simple things like complimenting the bagger at the grocery store for a nice job. <coughs> as simple as, you know, making the bed or doing the dishes, like little steps for it. When somebody's really in the muck of depression, it's all they can do to get out of bed. So as simple as it seems, steps are important as far as getting there. You're not going to go from kindergarten to college freshman right away. It doesn't work. And if you try, it's going, you're going to like suffocate and... <coughs> it's not going to happen. But if you take it a little bit at a time, and I've kind of taken 50 or so of them, and I've written little things, and then that's going to be the next book I'd love to have out next year. Um, not one to want to say, oh, I'm going to have it out by, because that's just asking for trouble. i kind of a squirrel and things get. I get distracted a little easily. <laughs> but so that's kind of what I got going on um, I'll be kicking around for a little bit if um, somebody's interested in a book or if somebody's interested in chatting or has any questions or complaints I, I take those too <laughs> um, they're free anyway I can't thank you enough for coming. This a Saturday before Christmas. There's all kinds of places that, you know, we could have been, we could have chosen to been, and you chose to hang out with me for a little while. I can't thank you enough. So thank you all. A wonderful Christmas. Well, rock. <laughs>